Like I said before, we're now in the last book of Daniel. Daniel has 12 chapters. And for me, and I hope for you too, it has been a wonderful experience of learning through this prophetic book. Wednesdays, we go deeper. We go verse by verse, chapter by chapter. And on Sundays also, we preached. I preached in every single one of the chapters in the book of Daniel. And it's the first time that I've preached the book of Daniel. I've studied Daniel for many years. <laughs> in fact, my last, one of my last classes in, in, um, in seminary, that's one of the books I studied, the book of Daniel. And, and let me tell you something. If there's ever a book that will give you hope, is the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel is, is a book that talks to us about the future. It's prophetic in nature, especially the last chapters of the book, starting from chapter 7, 8, and so on until the very end, until now, chapter 12. And you're going to see here in a moment that Daniel prophesies. He talks about the future. And Daniel, from the, from the very get-go, from the very beginning, since he was a young man, he was faithful to God. And as he grew up in Babylon, as a captive, he was always faithful to God. And that's something that we see in Daniel. I think one of the most faithful men in the entire Bible is Daniel. And as you read all the chapters, chapter 1, 2, 3, and so on and so forth, you don't read anything wrong. You don't, think, you don't read anything bad about Daniel. It's almost as if, it was, as if he was perfect. Now, obviously, he wasn't. But I'm saying that it's just you don't read any bad things, like, if, like you know, having bad thoughts or doing bad things, although he was dead smack in the middle of a pagan nation with pagan gods. And I'm sure there was a lot of temptation in his surroundings. There was a lot of temptation everywhere that he walked. If you recall, Daniel was, after the king, he was the second or third in command. That was pretty much all his entire adult life until he died. And we, we think that he died around he was about 90 years old. So I'm going to say since he was in his early 20s till he died, which is about 90 years old, Daniel was a, 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 a faithful man to God. And that's why one of the books that I've studied throughout all, throughout all my years has been precisely for that reason. And even till today, I go back to Daniel. I go back to this book, and I read it over and over again. Because Daniel is, is an inspiration, an inspiration to all of us. Because he has shown to be a man of integrity. This man did not waver in his faith. And time after time, he, he proved to be faithful to God. Even in the toughest of circumstances, he his ground. Even when the culture went against his beliefs, he stood his ground. Even when he was told to stop believing in God, he stood his ground. Even when he was thrown in the, in the lion's den, he stood his ground. Amen. Praise the Lord. Yes. Praise God. He simply was a great example. And it's no surprise that God trust, trusted him with one of the greatest revelations of the Bible. It's no surprise to me that God trusted him with revealing to him the coming of the Messiah. I mean, this is huge, everybody. This is great. He, he prophesied the first coming of Christ, but he also prophesied the second coming of Christ. And one of the things that I wait for personally in my life is that one day Christ will come. Just like he did the first time, he's going to come back the second time, like the Bible says, like his word of God says. How many await the second coming of Christ? Amen? Praise the Lord for that. 
So God reveals this message to Daniel. God reveals this message of hope because that's what it is. It's a message of hope. For me, my greatest hope is that one day I'm going to see Christ face to face like the Bible says. And I hope that, that I can see Christ and, and that, he can, that he will come now in, in, in our time frame. That's my hope. My hope that one day that we're going to be here on Sunday worshiping the Lord and then in the twinkling of an eye, like the Apostle Paul says, we no longer will be here. Amen? Now, don't ask me, you know, how that's going to happen. Only God knows. Just like when he created the heavens and the earth. Don't ask me how that happened. But it happened because we're here. <laughs> it, it, it happened because... We can enjoy the heavens and the earth, and we know that they exist because we exist. So there's a hope for the future. It's a hope that says everything is going to be okay. And, and there's times, and I'll be honest with you, you're not going to believe this, but there's times where I feel down. There's times that I feel sad for whatever the reason is. I'm sure you have felt that way too because we're human. And sometimes things get us down, right? Sometimes things happen in our life. And we feel bad. We feel saddened. Just like... This, this week that passed by, I was deeply saddened by missionaries that were, that were killed in Haiti. He probably heard that, that news. And only God knows why things happen, why those kind of things happen. Um, and both were killed. But all I know is that now both of them, this young couple, they're in heaven with the Lord. Only God knows why that happened, and, and I'm deeply saddened by that. But I know that there is an eternal hope, just like what this young couple believed, and now they're in that eternal, they're, they're in eternity with Christ And sometimes things do not look good. But I want to tell you this morning that despite things not looking good in your present state, God has not left your side. God is still with you. God is still with us. Amen? How many can praise God? Because there is hope for the future. At this moment, the people of Israel had been in, in captivity for, I mean, for 70 years. There were moments of suffering. There were moments of anguish. But God never left their side. God never left Israel. Despite that, when we're going through those tough times, we do feel like we're by ourselves. We feel like we're alone. But the Bible assures us that God is with us. He never leaves our side. And in Daniel's prophecies, Israel would continue to be dominated by other nations. When he wrote these prophecies, Israel was dominated by the Babylonians, then the Medo Persians. Then later they would be dominated by the Greeks. And then finally, the Romans. And, and the reason for that is because Israel had problems. There were two major problems that Israel had. One was their disobedience to God. And the second one was their idol worship. And it seemed that their future did not look good because Israel would be oppressed, they would be attacked by their enemies, they would be abused be abandoned. 
And if you really, really study Israel history, that's what they've gone through their entire history. And as we study the Scriptures, we see that they're going to continue in this way until the Messiah comes. They will continue to suffer. They will continue to be a suffering people, just like right now. It's no secret to, to anyone what's going on in, in the Middle East right now. There's no secret to what is going on with Israel as they were attacked by their enemies, and now they're being attacked again, basically, by the world, all because they are defending themselves. But that all of this that's going on right now has been prophesied. The Bible says that this would continue, and that it would continue until, until Christ comes again, until the Messiah comes again. And the Messiah would, would save them, not only from their enemies, but mainly he would save them from their sin. And if there's one thing that God saves us is from that, is from our sins. And praise God for that. Praise God for that, that one day he came into our lives, he came into our hearts, and he saved us. That's why we're here today, and that's why we praise God, and that's why we we do the things that we do for the Lord. That's why we're faithful to Him. Because one day He saved us from our sin. And that's the reason why Jesus came to this earth. To save us from our sin. Going back to Daniel. He had that opportunity to go back to Jerusalem. The 70 years were up. And Daniel thought, Wow, this is so awesome because now we can all go back. We can all go back to the promised land. We can all go back to Jerusalem. We can all go back to Israel. And he was happy because he was still alive. He was able to see the people of God returning back home. It was the greatest day of his life. The 70 years of captivity had ended this was their chance. This was their opportunity. But you're not going to believe it. The majority of them, they didn't want to go back. And that's when Daniel said, what? Maybe not like that, but pretty much he was very surprised that his people that were in captivity, in bondage, that they didn't want to go back? I mean, this to him, it didn't make any sense to him. It, it, he, it was not acceptable to him. How could it be that, that you don't want to go back? Here you're, you're, you're in chains, you're, you're, you're slaves. This is not your country. And now you don't want to go back? I mean, this was disheartening to Daniel. It was disheartening because they were deciding to continue living as slaves. They wanted to continue living in bondage. You know that at times I, I find myself meeting with people that are living in, in addiction. Or I find myself with meeting people that, that are living in serious problems. And one of the first things I, I, I do is I present them the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because if there's anything that's going to save you, it's, it's going to be Christ. It's going to be Jesus. And there's so much hope. And, and, and I talk to them about Christ. I tell them that he is the only answer to their problems, to the root of their, of their problem, to the root of their addiction, to the root of their financial problem, the root of their, their marital problems is Christ. And I would tell them that. And there's so much hope because my prayer is always is that they accept Christ into their life. And Now, it doesn't mean that all the problems are going to go away, but now at this point you have God at your side. 
you have a big opportunity at that point to fix your life. But unfortunately, at times, many times, they reject Jesus because they would rather continue living in their sin. That's when I scratched my head and I'm like, wait a second. You're living in, 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 in captivity. You're, you're, you're suffering. But you want to continue living this way? And it just hurts. Because I don't want to continue seeing them living that way. The Israelites had the opportunity to go back home, to go back to their homeland. They want to go back. In fact, one of the reasons that Daniel didn't go back because he was trying to push his people and say, hey guys, what are you talking about? What do you mean you don't want to leave? Come on, we got to go, we got to go. And it's in that time frame that Daniel dies. Isn't that sad? I mean, he stays back to try to encourage his people so that they can go. And he ends up dying. He never went back home. Since the moment that he was in captivity, he was taken from the Babylonians. From that moment on till about 90 years old, he never went back to, to his homeland. He was never able, never able to see his country again. For Daniel, this was unbelievable. It is unbelievable that we have fought all this time. Seventy years we have fought. We have, we've had the dream of, of, of going back to, to our homeland, to Jerusalem. And in his mind, I could imagine, he's constantly, he was probably constant, constantly thinking, how could you not want to go back home? How could you not want to go back to your people? How could you not want to go back to your God? That's, way, if you go, that's, that's why if you go back to Daniel 10, verses 2 and 3, this is what it says. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks. I ate no delicacies, no meat, or wine entered my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all for the full three weeks. Basically, what I'm saying is that Daniel was devastated. I mean, he was deeply saddened because he saw that his people would rather stay back home, rather stay in Babylon and not go back home because they wanted to continue living in their sin. And this was deeply saddening to him. And it's here when, when, when Daniel is praying to God, he is here that he, he, he is in mourning over this situation that he's going to God and he's asking God for, for a solution to this problem, thinking that God would, would tell him exactly what to do for that immediate problem. But God had a much bigger plan. You know something, church? God does have a bigger plan for you. He does. He has a bigger plan, and all we have to do is have faith and have that hope that God will deliver. It is in these last chapters of chapter 10, 11, and 12 that God reveals the future to Daniel. God revealed to Daniel that the Messiah, Jesus Christ, would come to this earth not, but, and not only save his people, but save the world. 
He would save the people in this little town called Boynton Beach, where you live. <laughs> and he would come and save Lake Worth and Delray Beach. Anybody live in Delray Beach? Delray Beach? Anybody? Yeah, Delray Beach. Okay. All right. So he'd come and save Delray Beach in Boca. <laughs> I mean, it was the greatest message of hope, the coming of the Messiah. It's the greatest hope that you can have to know that your Savior would come and save you, especially for Israel, especially for the oppression that they lived throughout all their history. Again, even till today, Attacked by their enemies. Killed. Still, God would have to deal with them. God would still need to continue testing his people. Israel would continue suffering. And throughout the thousands of years, we have seen Israel's suffering. And it's never been let up. It's, it's constant. It's been constant. Thousands of years. Now, in most recent history, we have seen the Holocaust. How many remember the Holocaust? With Germany. Let me remind you of that recent history concerning the Jews. Approximately 6 million Jews died. I was reading an article on the Holocaust just recently, and it, and it broke it down, because I've always thought of it as 6 million Jews being killed and maybe thinking that they were all killed the same way or at the same time. No. It was a, a slow death. But I can't, I mean, I can't even fathom the, the numbers that I'm going to give to you. I mean, this couple that died just recently, it hit me hard, and there were just two. But these are large numbers. For example, approximately, now get this, 2.7 million Jews were killed in the gas chambers. Another 2 million were shot to death. And another one million were killed in concentration camps. And they just basically died of hunger. I mean, it's, it's just terrible. And this kind of thing would continue, according to what we read in the prophecies, until the end of time. And in this chapter... 11, what we read, what we studied last week. The Bible shows us that there's going to be an evil ruler. He's going to rise in the end time. And this leader would dominate the world. He would conquer the world. And the Bible describes him as the Antichrist. And this Antichrist figure establishes himself as God the point where he would force the people to worship him. Now, this is where the problem begins with, with Israel. Because there's going to be a truce, the Bible says. The Antichrist, he's going to fool Israel. He's going to tell them, I'll be able to protect you. The Ten Nation Confederation in Europe they're going to be able to protect you. You have no problems. And for the first time, Israel is going to trust them. But this Antichrist is going to break the truce. He's going to fool them. Because he's going to want to come into their temple. He's going to sit on the throne of David and he's going to pass himself off as God. 
And if there's anything they know, they know that that cannot be because their Messiah is coming from the heavens. They know that. They know that he definitely can't be the, the, the Messiah. And that's when the problems begin. Because if there's anything that you didn't need to know about the Israelites and that you know already, that they're stubborn people. I'll tell you what. I've been there twice, and, and I've seen it firsthand. <laughs> they're not going to budge on their beliefs. And that's when the problems begins. Because Antichrist is going to want them to, to worship him. Because that's what the Antichrist will do at the end. He's going to force people to worship him. He is going to want to be more than God. And the Jews are going to say, no, we're not going to do that. We're not going to worship you. We only worship God. And good for them. But the problem begins. The persecution begins. The Antichrist, according to the Word of God, he's going to kill many Jews. Out of three Jews, he's going to kill two. That way you can get an idea of that he's going to kill a lot. A lot of them. What we've just read right now in Daniel 12:1. But it tells us that it's going to be the worst time in all of their history. I just described to you certain parts of their history where they've suffered immensely. Persecution of millions killed throughout their history. But here Daniel is saying that's nothing in comparison to what's going to happen in the end times. It's nothing in comparison to the suffering that Israel will go through. I mean, I mean, let's go back and read verse 1 again, Daniel 12, 1. And it says, at that time, he's talking about the end times. It says, at that time shall arise Michael, the great prince, who has charged your people, and there shall be time of trouble, such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. Do you hear what this prophecy is saying? Do you know that Jesus also prophesied something similar to this? He did. Now, I want you to listen to what Jesus prophesied, and it's very similar. The only thing that Jesus gives us more information. Jesus gives us more detail, and of course, because Jesus is God. God knows everything. He knows the future. He knows your future. He knows my future. And this is what Jesus said to his disciples, uh, Matthew 24 and if you get a chance, read Matthew 24 and 25 here. Jesus himself is prophesying. He's telling us the future. And this is what he says. Precisely on that moment, when the Antichrist sits on that throne, he's trying to deceive the people of God. He's trying to deceive the Jews and, and making them think that he is the Messiah. When the Jews know, no way, you cannot be the Messiah. This is what Jesus said. Matthew chapter 24, verses 15 through 21. Now listen to this. Jesus said, said this. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. What he's trying to say is that, that the Antichrist is going to want to sit on the throne where the Messiah is supposed to sit. And when he does that, verse 16, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in the house. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath for then there will be great tribulation. Not just tribulation, Great tribulation, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now. No, and never will be. 
words of Jesus himself. I mean, this is so, so disheartening. There was a pact that was made. There was a pact that was signed off. And, 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 and this Antichrist figure was supposed to protect them. And what he ends up doing is fooling the people of God, the Jews. This prophecy tells us that he is going to desecrate their temple. And the Jews will be in shock they can't believe it. And if you go to Revelation, starting in chapter 6, all the way to chapter 19, it describes this period of time. It describes this seven-year period called the tribulation. Chapter 6 to chapter 19 in Revelation describes this final time. This end time. And by the way, there are other things that are happening at this precise moment. And the Apostle John, he captures this. He, the Apostle John captures this great tribulation as Jesus mentions here in Matthew 24. And this is what John sees, the Apostle John. Now listen to this. He sees famine. He sees pestilence. And he sees darkness. He also sees that one-third of the earth is destroyed. He, stars, he also sees the stars falling on folks. There's people that tell me, Pastor, you know something? I'll, I'll go on the next round. In other words, hey, I'm not, I'm not going to make the rapture, but I'll just go on the, sec, on the, next, on the second round, meaning during the tribulation period. I say, hey, man, don't even joke like that, bro. Don't even say that, man. Obviously, they have no idea of what people are going to go through in the tribulation. He sees famine. He sees pestilence. He sees darkness. He sees one-third of the earth Destroyed, killed, stars falling, the fish and sea creatures from, from, the, from the sea, they die. So there's going to be a great suffering in the world. And if that's not enough, demons are going to be set loose to torture the people of the earth. And you know what's going to happen? The Bible says that people are, are, are going to take rocks. Hey, you know, fall on me, and they're going to want to die. And you know what's going to happen at that moment? God is going to stop death for just for a little bit, for a minute there. Death is going to stop. People are not going to be able to die. They're going to have to go through that. Suffering. So in the middle of all of that, the Antichrist is, is persecuting Israel. Zechariah, he describes it this way. Zechariah chapter 13, verses 8 through 9. In the whole land, declares the Lord, two-thirds shall be cut off and perished, and one-third shall be left alive. And I will put this third into the fire and refine them as one refined silver and test them as gold is tested. They will call upon my name and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people. And they will say, the Lord is my God. People say, but a pastor, what do you mean that God is, is going to do all of that? He's going to allow all of that. He's going to allow all the pestilence. He's going to allow the stars to fall on the people. He's going to allow for, for people not to die. He's going to allow all these things. But you've got to understand exactly what Zechariah is saying here. That, that that tribulation period is a refining period as well. He says, just like one refined silver. And just like gold has to be tested. But I love verse 9. I love 
verse 9. And it says, they will call upon his name and that he would answer them. You know what God's going to say? He says it right there. He says, they are my people. How many can praise God for that? Amen? You know what that means? That even in this terrible period, even in this tribulation period, there's going to be salvation because that's what God is about. Saving. That's what God's about. And we see that through all this time in history, even in this darkest of times in this tribulation period, God is about salvation. Let me prove it to you one more time. Let's go back again to Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. Listen to this. At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince who has charge of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never have been since before there was a nation till that time. But... Now get this, but at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. Do you see what it says at the end of verse 1? It says that God would deliver his people. I mean, I love the fact that he has an archangel fighting for his people. In fact, we studied this a couple of Wednesdays ago in our Bible study. Michael is one of the most powerful angels in heaven. Let me, let me show you this. Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. It says this. Now war arose in heaven, and Michael, there he is, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, against the devil, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated, talking about the devil. And there was no longer any place for them in heaven. That's the moment that the devil... His demons were thrown out of heaven. They no longer have a place with God. They lost that privilege. So we see here that this great angel is given the task to defend Israel. We see Michael in other parts of the Bible defending Israel. And that's the reason I I present to you today that there is hope. That there is hope. God is saying, I see your suffering. I see your tribulation. But he's also saying, I will deliver you. I will deliver you. So church today, the message, if you forget everything that I've said this morning, please don't forget this. Never lose hope. God bless you. Amen. Hi, Pastor Manny here. We thank you so much for tuning in. It's a true blessing for us. If you like what you heard today, please go right ahead and download the message or share it with others. But we also invite you to come to our church at Boynton Beach. God bless you all.